thank you for being with us tonight, this Wednesday night. We thank you for tuning in and listening to the Word of God and the message from the Lord. I've got something that I know the Lord has dealt with me upon. I know I've fought all kind of warfare. Uh, it, it's been unbelievable just trying to get this message out. Because the enemy don't want me to preach it, but I don't care. I'm going to preach what God gives me, and you need to hear it. And I thank you for listening. I wish that everyone that I knew would listen, because we all need to hear this, including myself. I want to come out of the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul writing the Church of Corinth, 2nd chapter. I want you to look with me, if you will, in your Bibles, 2 Corinthians 2 and 14. I'm going to go through the 17th verse. I want you to find it and, and, and uh, follow it, because it's imperative that you read and, and hear the Word of God at the same time. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make manifest the Savior of His knowledge by us in every place. He always, it is by His power and intervention that we have victory. God intends for the church, the body of Christ, to be victorious. He doesn't want us in defeat. He doesn't want us waving white flags and bartering. He wants us to always be victorious because we're making manifest. We're revealing to a world the glory and the wonder of a God who's able to bring us and deliver us and keep us in everything that we are confronted with and the warfare that we're engaged in. It goes on to say, for we are under God a sweet Savior, a sweet aroma of Christ, and that they are saved and in them that perish. So either way, we are an aroma to those that are saved and also to them that, that perish, that will miss out with heaven and go to hell. To the one, we are the aroma of death unto death, and to the other, a aroma of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, they peddle the word of God in the Greek, but of the sincerity, but as of God and the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So what Paul was saying is, listen, we just tell you the truth. We don't tickle your ears. We don't try to pacify you. We're not concerned about being politically correct. We're not concerned about getting the accolades of man. We're not concerned about whether we get a majority vote or not. What we must speak is the words of God in your ears and in your presence and live in them words because that's the only thing that will set you free. So I want to talk to you tonight about the necessity of us being victorious and always being victorious. Father, have your way tonight. Touch us in a dynamic way. I thank you, Lord, for the word of God and the spirit of God. I praise you, Lord, because victory is ours. And you've declared it. You've said you cause us to be victorious. That we can be make manifest your glory and your love and your power and your ability to a world that knows nothing but sorrow and heartache and bondage of defeat and brokenness. Lord, I pray that you'll touch us tonight and challenge us. And, and let us walk in the presence of the Spirit of God. And let us be a, a, a light. Let us be a, an effectiveness to the world that has been deceived by Satan. And Lord, that we can have an impact upon them. And for what is accomplished, I give it praise. Touch every heart, every ear that's tuned in. I pray that the anointing will open their eyes and open their ears and, and touch their hearts. So they'll open the doors of their heart and receive the word of God. And let the seed be planted for all that is accomplished. We've been praise and glory and honor first in Jesus name we pray amen these are unprecedented times like I've never seen in the 50 years of, that I've been serving the Lord this year marks 50 years of, that I've been saved when he gloriously found me and delivered me and set made me whole as we look around and watch the news channels and read the newspapers and hear all the articles that are coming forth, our nation is in upheaval and the world is in turmoil and it's going to get much worse, much, much more worse. These things shall come to pass and nothing's going to change that. So you better gird your launch and you better prepare yourself and be settled down and ready to endure to the end because that's the only way you can be saved. But the scripture tells us in 1 Peter 3 and 15, but sanctify the Lord your God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you for a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always ready to give an answer when they come and ask you how is it you got this hope? You see, when asked why, what, what is happening to our country and to our world, uh, don't put the fault, listen to me tonight, don't put the fault or blame on some political party or some particular race or individual sex uh, that may have ulterior motives uh, as bad as they may be and as guilty as each one can be or may be. The things that are happening have, that are taking place in our world and our nation have been birthed in the pits of hell. It's been birthed by the power 
power of Satan and the spirit of the Antichrist and the Antichrist that will be revealed when the church is raptured. It's birthed out of hell. Oh, listen, I want you to realize and know this, that the Antichrist and Satan could care less about how you have an adequate housing. They could care less about whether you get equal pay, equal opportunity for educational benefits, recognition and understanding and opportunities lined up. He don't care whether you're accepted or rejected in society. He don't care. I want you to listen to me and understand very clearly. Everything that is happening right now, all the plots and the schemes of the enemy that is bringing turmoil and, and, and stirring the hate and the, uh, the anguish and the resistance and the uh, unbelievable uh, uh, ungodly acts that are taking place in the hearts of those that are lost, unregenerated, those who are serving the master, Satan, in these last days. Every bit of it is not just to get our nation to do, uh, you know, lift up equality or equal race or to equal pay or to climb a, you know, a green deal. None of that. Satan could care less about that. No, no, no. I want you to know what the real purpose is. And you mark my words. You'll see down in the road to come in the future that you're going to see. I'm telling you the truth. Everything the enemy's doing right now is to lay the foundation that in the near future he can shut the doors of the church. He wants the doors of the church to be shut. He wants to mute the voices of every minister and every uh, prophet. He wants to mute the voice of every messenger. He wants to stop the gospel from going forward. He's doing everything they can. He wants to divide the body of Christ and the family of God so that there's so no, no, no unity among us. He wants to snatch away the courage and the confidence that one has in God and in his word. Listen to me. I'm not tickling your ears. I'm telling you the truth. If you come to the place in your walk and you proclaim to know Jesus Christ and you proclaim to be a member of the church or a part of the church and you're okay and you're not guilty and feel convicted every time you lay out when we meet and gather together to worship Him and to lift up our voices and praise Him, if it doesn't stir you and make you feel horrible that you're laying out and missing the opportunity to give God praise and glory for the things He's done, to know that your name is written down. If it doesn't stir you until the conviction, until you can't hardly stand missing the house of God, I want you to hear me. You are not rapture ready. You've allowed the world to come in. You've become the friends of the world. And your focus and your goal and your desire on heavenly things and the invisible things have been dissipated. The enemy has lured you away. I want you to know there ought to be a hunger, desire, and passion to be in the house of God with every saint of God, every time the doors open. There ought to be a longing, a desire, oh, a quest to say, Lord, if I can get in the presence of the Spirit of God, because you said we're two or three are gathered together, so shall we be in the midst of them. God, I want you to know I wish that, oh, God, I wish it, that everyone would have that kind of desire. And if you don't, I want you to know you're really not ready. You're really not ready to be raptured. You've been pulled away. Your first love has left you and died. And you better repent, because that Spirit of the Antichrist and the power of Satan and the influence of the world has lured you away. And that's what the enemies want to do. He wants to make the church impotent and powerless against every stronghold that he's put upon the lives of every individual. He might can't take you down as a child of God who's hungry, but he's got multitudes that are dying. Uh, the prophet Isaiah said, Hell enlarges itself daily. Hell and destruction is never full. My God, there's people perishing every single day and open in their eyes and hell like the rich man and if we're not in the place we can be and have power and victory and anointing we can't break their strongholds and they'll be snatched away. He wants to snuff out the light of Christ in you and he wants to force the savior of your soul to become unworthy and useless until it's good for nothing but to be trampled underfoot and he wants the church to just be a sideline to just be a historical reflection. He don't want the church to have an impact. And I'm telling you tonight, it's time we stir ourselves and wake ourselves and, and realize, God, that in these last days, we need to rise like we never have. We need to wave the banner of faith and tell the world and Satan that we're not laying dormant no more. We're going to raise up like Samson did. We're going to shake ourselves and realize we've lost the anointing. We're not effective. We're trying to maintain this our own and our families and hope they don't go to hell. 
But our goal and our commandment of God and our, our commission is going to the highways and the byways and compel, compel them to come in. I'm telling you, we need to shake ourselves like never before. And we need to realize, oh God, how can we be like Jonah down in the bottom of the ship while those on top are perishing? Until they ask the question, care it not that we perish? I believe if we can listen to the hearts of the those that are bound in sin and iniquity, those that have lost hope, they would ask the church the same thing. Do you care not that we perish? The church is to be the place that they can find deliverance through the power of Christ and the authority of the Word of God. And we're to administer that and we're to have victory. We need to shake ourselves and say, oh God, like never before, let us return. Let us get back to the place where we know what it is to have the glory of God present itself and the flow of the Spirit and be used for your glory. The sinners know if they get in the house of God, something's going to happen. That if they can make it to an altar in the house of God, their lives are going to be changed. That there's no power in hell that can bind them. There's not enough demons in hell that can hold them back when they want to run to Christ and be delivered. And oh, God, help us to have a place. When they walk in, they're not comfortable. No, no, no. We don't want them comfortable. We want them on pins and needles. We want them to realize for the first time that they're within a hair breadth, they're within a spiral web of the eternal damnable flames of hell for eternity, and they'll never get out unless they re be redeemed and accept Christ as a Savior. Lord, help us to have a place where the Holy Ghost conviction moves again, not only on the sinner but on every saint, from the preacher to the back pew, to those that are in the back, to those that are involved with children's church. God, help us to stir us, because if there's ever been a time that the church needs to have victory and power is today. We need to know what the glory of God is. There's a need of victory. We need to realize the aggressiveness of Satan and the power of the spirit of the Antichrist. I think for too long we stuck our heads in the sand. I think we reflected back how it used to be and we, we get content. But I want you to know we're in 2020 and the world is in turmoil and the powers of hell are raging and we need to know and sense the power of God like never before. There's a personal devil out there. John wrote in the 8th chapter and he said this, you are of the father of the devil and the lust of your father ye will do. He, had, he was a murderer from the beginning and both not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh the lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it there's an aggression of Satan to come against all those and to deceive them and make them believe they're alright to pacify them and to get them to look at others and try to balance their life against somebody else, some hypocrite some backslidden preacher or some member that doesn't know the real genuine power of God and walk in righteousness, there's an aggression of the devil, he's aggressive he's a, as a roaring lion, the Bible said he's sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil has a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you. Sir, ma'am, young person, he wants to devour you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to rend you into pieces and take everything of your potential, everything that God had envisioned for you and destroy it because he's that kind of aggressive. He stands back with everything that's taken place. He looks at us and mocks us and makes fun of us. He don't want nothing of the Christian endeavor. He wants you to fall short. Oh, listen, he's a God of this world. And the Bible says he's blind in the minds of them which believe not. If you don't know Christ, you're blind. The word of God says so. He's blinded your eyes. You think you don't need church. You think everybody in church is a hypocrite. He's told you, listen, they're no better than you. But the reality is this. Oh, they're human like you and I. And, but oh, but their name is written down in the last book of life. And they're struggling. They're striving to walk over right before God. He's blinded your eyes and you believe not. And he's done that so the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is an image of God, should not shine on you. And you recognize Christ. You recognize Christ through the church. But church, listen, we should be the image. We should be the reflection of Christ. We should be the one that they can see him in us. As a refiner, we ought to be able to look and see us and see him through us. And that's what we need to do. I want you to know that the enemy is out to do all that he can. And in the midst of all this, he realized that the biggest threat Satan and hell has is the body of Christ. 
He knows that the Lord has given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He knows that he's anointed us. He's given us the, the, the Holy Ghost that abides in us and walks with us. He's done these things that we can be effective. He's given us the gifts of the Holy Ghost. He's given us the fruits that we can be an effectiveness in this last days. And so he realizes what he's got to do is come against the church. That's his biggest threat. And that's who he goes against. So here he is. He comes against us and he wants worldliness to come into church. He wants the church to compromise. He wants the church to be friendly. He wants the church to do the things that they want to do. Listen, James said, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoso therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We can't compromise. we got to stand true and true to God. we got to stand upon the word of God. We need to realize we preach this word. And when we preach this word, my God, we want the power of God to manifest. We're not here to appease and, and tickle ears, but we're here to preach the whole gospel and the truth, of, and it offends you, then you need to repent. Now listen to what happened in the days of the prophet Ezekiel in the second chapter. And he said, Oh, me, son of man, stand upon my feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and he set me upon my feet, and I heard him that spake unto me. Praise God. And he said, Oh, me, son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that are rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me. Even unto this day, my God, what an indictment. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do not send unto them, and they shall say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, and they whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house. Yet shall know that there have been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of the words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dwellest among scorpions, be not afraid of the words, nor be dismayed of their looks, that though they be a rebellious house, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they hear or whether they forbear, they are the most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like the rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat, and I will give thee. When he was telling Ezekiel, he'll tell the day to the present day minister, prophet, and messenger of God. Speak the words that I have spoken. The word of God. Don't alter it. Don't change it. Don't water it down. Just tell it like it is. I didn't write the book. I'm just a messenger of the book. And if I had not preached this whole word, if I violate the word, if I try to add to it, all the plagues would be added. If I try to take away from it, my name shall be taken out of the book of life. I've got to preach this word or else I'm damned for hell because the calling of God are without repentance. And so I'm going to preach truth because I love you. And the only thing that can set you free is the word of God and nothing else. And so we need to understand that even though to the world the preaching of the cross is offensive, the world doesn't like it. Wherefore, Peter said in the second chapter, it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in sign a chief cornerstone. You let precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of a fix. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, wherefore they were also appointed. To the world, they look at the cross, and they're offended by it. They don't want to see it. They don't want to consider it. They don't want to realize they got to die out to the flesh and serve God, but that's what it's going to take. And the church must take this on themselves first and foremost. We must be an impact to the world. We need to understand that, my God, they need to see us like never before. I know that when all they that live godly shall suffer persecution, I know living right and walking upright before God. I know walking in holiness and truth. I know that in these days that there's going to be persecution. You're going to be attacked and you're going to be ostracized and you're going to be looked down upon and you're going to be ridiculed. But it's for a short moment. The Lord is coming back. The Lord is coming back. The trump of God's going to sound. The church is soon to be raptured. You better endure that persecution because if you're not worthy to be persecuted with them, you will not be taken up for him and by him. And so we need to realize that we need to stand in the midst of it all no matter what takes place. And even though there's persecution, we have a responsibility to a world that is lost and dying and going to perish. That we must trudge through, trudge through all the mire and all the junk that the enemy puts up there, all the blindness, and find our way that we can
you reach them. I know it's getting more difficult to, to preach them, how to reach them with the preaching of the word. Because the problem is there's so many that have a form of godliness, but not deny the power thereof. There's many, my God, in these last days. Oh, listen, they've given over to things that they've sold themselves out. They're not in love with him. They lost their first love. Oh, my God. I want you to know that we must endure to the end. And we were living in the days when Paul, Paul, Paul Ryan and Timothy said, they will not endure sound doctrine. They want their ears tickled. They want someone to appease them and tell them that they're all right and accept them any way they want to live. But I want you to know the church is an ecclesia where the called out, called out from what? Called out from the world. Called out from sin. Called out from ungodliness. Called out from unrighteousness. Called out from the impact and the influence of the world. We're not to be conformed by them. We're to be an example to them. And they ought to be able to see Christ in us. And so if there's ever been a time that we need to take a stand is now. I think about Elijah in 1 Kings 18 chapter when they was at the point on Mount Herb and they were, and they were having a showdown and they have wanted to bring defeat and the children of Israel were divided. They didn't know which way they want to go. They were twixt a heart and a rock and a hard place. They were divided between which one they want to serve. I like to tell them, serve this Jesus to whom you're going to serve. If you're going to serve Baal, serve Baal. But if you're going to serve Jehovah, serve Jehovah. And he said, I want you to know that God answered by fire. He shall be God. But the Bible said they answered him not a word. They wouldn't make commitment. They wouldn't take a stand. They wouldn't let their hearts be shown. They wouldn't let everybody know, listen, I want everybody without any doubt to know where I stand. Now, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't say a word. They wanted to wait and see who they thought was going to win and try to be on the winning side. Listen, I'm going to be on God's side. It might appear that I might be losing, but I've read it in the book. Praise God, we win. I'm going to stand with God. It doesn't matter. I want everybody to know I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm not ashamed of Pentecost. I'm not ashamed of righteousness and holiness. They might call me old-fashioned. I don't care. They might say I'm an old folk. I don't care. What I care about is when I who are I'm going to when I speak out and cry, Jesus, then heaven hears me. And I get an access to the throne of God. Every day I get requests that people need a touch of God. They need a miraculous intervention. I want to know that I've got access, that I can go in there and intercede on their behalf and cry out for their purpose and their need. And know that God will not only accept me, but he'll hear me and he'll answer me. That's the kind of living we got to have in these last days. Because the world and the trump of God is going to sound. And those that got smaller, lovers, and wrinkled, that sit in the church are going to be left. And those that haven't accepted Christ are going to be left. They're going to perish in the judgment of God and wind up in hell. We need to awaken ourselves and shake ourselves and say, Oh God, let me once again behold your glory and your power. Can you say amen? My God. You see, there's so much going on. Paul warned the church of Colossians. He said, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication and uncleanliness and order and affection, evil concubines and covetousness, which is idolatry. He said, Mortify them. He's telling them, Listen, cleanse yourself. It's trying to have an effect on you. It's trying to lure you in and tempt you and trap you. And you need to mortify yourself. You need to crucify yourself. You need to put yourself on the altar and die out to all these things. Why? Because we're living in the last days. And we need to make sure that we don't allow spiritual defeat because of our vices or because of our lust or because of our habits or because of the things we desire that might be contrary to the will of God. We've got to crucify it all on our altars. We need to put altars back in our homes. Listen, they don't even hardly come to the altars in the church. And if they don't, I know they don't have an altar in the home. But we need to make sure we got an altar somewhere that we can get alone and cry out to God and say, Lord, I'm not in church today. It's Monday or Tuesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday. But I still need to crucify myself as Paul did every single day. Crucify myself daily that I can be found worthy to be called upon. And I can be found worthy for you to hear my prayers and be found worthy to be raptured. And when the trumpet of God sounds, so help me, Lord, to be what you called me to do, because I don't want to fail it. Oh, listen, the Bible tells us in Galatians, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do you do that? You stay on the altar. You stay in the Word. You stay before God. You cry to Him and you seek Him. And I want you to know we're living in His last days. We need 
need victory over the flesh. We need victory over apathy. We need victory over our, our, our tendencies to get slack. You come to the house of God and you might not be on the mountaintop, but you still owe God all your praise. Oh, there might be some battles and storms, but God knows what he's doing and he's stretching you and you owe God the highest praise you can give him. We can't allow ourselves to get slowful. We can't allow ourselves to get dim the vision and, and deaf ears that we can not hear the spirit of God and the whisper of intimacy. We need to be on fire for him. We need to realize, my God, that we are not saved just to build a pew, a build a pew but we're saved to be a light to a world that's lost and undone. Oh, listen, I want you to know that we've been sent unto the world. Listen what Paul said. This is the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. To win that God was in Christ, we can sound the world on himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as O God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. We are to reach out to a world. We need to tell them and cry out the alarm. Sound the alarm. Blow the trumpets. And let them know, listen, this thing is winding up. The Lord is coming. The time is short at hand. You better make sure everything's right. You can play games. You can be religious. You can try to give them the majority. But God's not going to listen to the majority. God's going to stand upon this book. He's going to see if your name's written down. And if your name is not written down, you'll be cast out. And if you play around with God and commit sin and let sin reign in you, he'll block your name out of the Lamb's book of life. Just read the book of Revelation. Look it up until you find it if you're hungry enough. I don't want to miss heaven. I don't know about you. Listen, there's one appointment that no one has ever failed to make, and that is an appointment with death. I remember when I was young, Houdini, Henry Houdini was a great musician. And he used to be able to escape all kind of locks and safes. And they said they couldn't hold him in. They put him in all kind of things. They put him in a safe. Put him under water in a river and he'd get escape. With a little bit of air he had in there, he'd escape. The greatest escape artist known to man at that time. And he told his wife, I'm going to escape death. Death won't hold me. He died and they waited. Every year on his anniversary, his wife was waiting for him to reappear. And I remember as a kid, I used to say, I'll tell you one thing. He might have escaped a jail. He might have escaped to save us. He might have escaped a box, but when death hits you, there is no escape. Why? Because it's appointed on the man. Man might have made the locks and the safe and the boxes, but God made death and life, and God put an appointment on it. It's appointed on every man wants to die, and then the judgment, and as sure as every man has died, every man is going to be the judgment. No one ever has, and no one ever will escape death. So I'm telling you, you better make preparations. You better make and as a body of Christ, we better examine ourselves and make sure that we are victorious, that God always gives us a victory. We have no excuse. We have nothing to put the blame on nobody. We've got to stand firm and true to God because there's a world of dying and perishing. It's in turmoil. Listen, we're around Charlotte, and we say, well, things are so bad. But in other big cities around this world, around this nation, rather, they've had six weeks every single day of rioting and protesting and arson and all kind of destruction and, and things that are going on and shootings. One-year-old children, two-year-old children, innocent mothers and uh, individuals being murdered and raped and things going on. Why? Because of the power of hell and the spirit of the Antichrist. And if there's ever been a time that we need to wake ourselves and say, listen, the answer is not some government. It's not the National Guard. It's not some kind of new legislation or law. No, 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 no. What it is is the body of Christ to rise up and put down the power of hell. Stand against it. We've got the power over the devil. Behold, I give you power to tread upon all the powers of the enemy. And none of my enemies shall harm you. We need to stand forth and rise up and declare war sin and ungodliness and righteousness against the Spirit of God. Until we're taken out, He won't be unleashed. And so we need to stand up and be what God's called us to be. I challenge you, church. I challenge you, saint. I challenge every one of you. Have you examine yourself? Are you ready to let your light shine? Has your light shine? Are you really the salt? Or are you just sing the song and quote the verse? Or do you make an impact? Do you make a change? Does the devil know you? Does the devil does the devil wait and rejoice in the fact that when you leave this world, you will no longer be a threat? I, I challenge you. Are you really ready? Is God pleased with your walking? 
your life. That's all that matters. Because God wants you to have victory. And anything that's trying to take away your joy and your rejoicing and giving them praise is trying to take away your victory. Listen to me. Some of you have lost your song. And some of you, the Holy Ghost is stirring me. You're listening to this. You're watching it on YouTube. And you've lost your testimony. You no longer share it. Because you're not confident in it. You've lost confidence in God. Things have not gone well. Things aren't gone the way you thought they should. Oh, and you're kind of pulling back. You're having second thoughts and doubting the promise of God and the assurance of God and the faithfulness of God. But I challenge you, repent. Repent. Fourteen years, Joseph, who walked up right before God, would not sin against his God, was in a prison, in a jail. Oh, it was not good accommodations. It was horrible con conditions. But he was 14 years and did nothing except he realized when his brothers come and revealed himself. Listen, God, it was God's will. You thought you caused me to come here, but it wasn't you. It was God that put me in the right position so I could save the lineage for Christ down the road. Listen, you don't understand understand what's going on because it's a spiritual warfare. But the place you're in, God is ordained. And in that, he's going to make sure you come out victorious. Don't look at what's happening now. Don't look at what's taking place. No. Look futuristic. Look down the road. Say, I know my God shall deliver me. And then walk backwards. Say, Lord, I know I'm going to have victory. I'm going to walk all the way back to the present. From the future, but in the midst. I'm going to keep focusing on the future and know that, God, you've got a plan, a purpose, and I trust you. And you shall bring me out because thanks be unto God, which always giveth us the victory. Victory is yours. We used to sing that song. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. I'm telling you, you need to stand up. And we need to shake ourselves. And we need to be an impact upon the world. Instead of everyone looking at what the enemy's doing, they need to be crying out, saying, My God, look at the church. It's a rose. It's awakened. It's shaking itself. It's come out of high. And it's marching, it's gotten aggressive, and the gates of hell could not prevail against it because God declared it. That's why He purposed us and bought us and produced us and made us and formed us to be the body of Christ. We are to be an impact even to the moment before the rapture of the, of the saints of God in the church. We're to be an impact. Are you doing it? Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I pray that everyone. Everyone who's listening will look in their hearts. If we get the church on fire, this whole world will be different. Our community will be different. And most of all, our homes will be different. Our children will be different. <laughs> oh, God, help us. Help us, God, to ask a simple question. If everybody in church, in the family of God, in Christ, was just like me, what kind of church would there be? What kind of impact would the world have if everybody mimicked me? God help me to be the one that everybody wants to look to and follow in the footsteps. Help me, Lord, to be an impact. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, help us. And for what is the comments, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and honor. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Continue to do so. Just spread the word out. Let others know about it. Let them listen to it. They need to hear the word of God. We'll be here Sunday morning. Again, if you want us to be in the park lot, we'll be out there. For those that can't come in or be around people, we want to make sure you're ministered to. We've got live streaming on both both the Fellowship Hall and the Sanctuary. So you can come in the Sanctuary. And when you walk in, if you want to take your mask off because it hinders you, just, just go to the far side over here away from the parking lot. And if you're intimidated and want to wear a mask, then sit on here. And if you, if you don't want to wear a mask on one side or be around those that are wearing masks, go to the very back. Back and those in the back aren't wearing masks until they come in. And when they come in and they sit down, they take their mask off. So we're trying to accommodate everyone we can. We're doing the best we can. And we're, do, we're going to do what we can to make sure that there is no uh, epidemic that we start because we didn't follow as much of the guidelines we possibly could. I love you and appreciate and thank God for you. Have a great night. God bless you.